The Kremlin houses the offices of the central government. It is both a symbol of Soviet power and the site of some fine architecture of the past. But not, as the princess discovered, quintessentially Russian. For like so many striking buildings here, they've been built by Italian architects hundreds of years ago. The cathedrals around the wide square are now used as museums, although in these more enlightened times, even the Uspensky Cathedral within the Kremlin is sometimes used for religious services. This is Russia's principal church, spacious, solemn, the rare, rather Byzantine decorations covering the walls and pillars up to the very ceilings. And they date as far back as the 11th century. This is where the Tsars of all Russia were often crowned. The carved throne of Ivan the Terrible stands here. The Tsar, whose efforts to expand into Europe even included offering to marry Queen Elizabeth I of England. And in the famous armory, the Princess Royal was to see even more of the fabulous treasure trove of the Tsars. The ermine-trimmed caps used before crowns became fashionable. Thrones studded with diamonds and pearls. The solid gold icons. And the exquisite, priceless Fabergé Easter eggs they used to give as presents. Midday on Red Square, where the guard is changed each hour on Lenin's mausoleum. The square is, by tradition, a national theater, where the country's leaders attend the great displays of pageantry and power. Although, until the arrival of Gorbachev, they were getting dangerously out of step with the people they ruled. It is also a place all visitors come to see, and the Princess Royal was no exception, to stand for a few moments in a place so steeped in Russian history, and to create another small piece of history herself, with the royal standard fluttering for the first time in Red Square, beneath the hammer and sickle flying above the Kremlin. President Gorbachev's reforms do depend on people rediscovering an initiative and creativity which has been severely repressed. In the streets, this is beginning to emerge as private enterprise allows people to trade and to make a profit. But economic reform in the Soviet Union has a depressing history, and the long queues still form instantly whenever goods become available, particularly in the food stores. At Moscow State University, the Princess Royal met and talked with students, dealing briskly, in her usual manner, with queries about British democracy, capitalism, and, not unexpectedly, the royal family itself. Um, how does it feel having a Buckingham Palace as your private property? <laughs> well, I don't know, because it isn't. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a state-owned establishment. Um, I wasn't actually born there. I mean, I have my office there and my, the Queen lives there, but it's not really private property. <laughs> how did you begin? I mean, how did you come to this idea to help others? I was asked if I'd like to become president of the Save the Children Fund. Um, to some extent, it was the work that I saw other people doing as volunteers, and the amount of effort and time they put into it. And that helped enormously. It just proved what could be done by an attitude of mind as much as anything else. But I think I've learnt that from the people that I've met and from the organisations that I've been asked to become involved in. At the Soviet space tracking centre outside Moscow, there were hopes she might also be able to talk to the two cosmonauts who'd been up in space for some three months. Their mere spacecraft, the bright dot on the map, was just coming into communication range of a Soviet ground station. So. Would the princess like to talk to them? Certainly she would. And picking up the phone, had a chat. Thank you. And is Saturday the day you get to talk to your families as well? Our families come here to come to the space control center and we can see each other and talk. Well, that must be a great relief to you. Hauntingly beautiful. The gold and blue domes of the Trinity Monastery of St. Sergius lift above the battlements of its fortress walls. 
here at Zagorsk, not far from Moscow, great and deeply rooted traditions of the old life and culture linger on. And you can see and feel the heartbeat of ancient Russia. Through the long years of religious persecution, this was the center of the Russian Orthodox Church, with a fervency of prayer and the intensity of faith there's no doubt that, in this officially atheist state, Christianity is still very much alive. Monks have lived, studied, and worshipped here since the 14th century, when the monastery was founded by a remarkable man whose drive and leadership united the Russians as never before to throw off the burden of foreign Mongol rule. Canonized as St. Sergius, he lies buried deep in Trinity Cathedral, a shrine for the devout and nationalist alike. At the Bolshoi Theater, an art form which for long has been inextricably linked with Russia, ballet. This was to be the last of the more obvious tourist attractions the princess would see before her 7,000 mile journey through the Soviet Union. The Ballet Giselle, on the stage where so many of the world's most famous dancers had started their careers. Lake Baikal, the blue eye of Siberia, lay isolated and unknown for over 50 million years. The oldest lake on the planet, it's 400 miles long, nearly a mile deep, and holds one-fifth of the world's clearest and purest fresh water reserves. With the passing of the harsh, icy winter, the early summer flowers blossom. Young school children make the most of the warmer weather, learning at the same time on field trips about the wealth of natural history in this ancient and unique geographical phenomenon. After the spring thaw, rivers play a crucial role in Siberian transport. Most people travel on water in these remote regions. So too did the Princess Royal. In a small remote fishing village on the southern tip of the lake, a Soviet research ship waited to take the princess on board. To see for herself some of the work the Limnological Research Institute carries out on increasing fish stocks and maintaining the quality of the water. British scientists are already involved with their Soviet counterparts working in this extraordinary environment, where of the two and a half thousand living species so far identified, nearly one half are unique to this lake. These conditions allow the scientists in the ship above to use this purity as a baseline for measuring pollution on a global level. As the ship steamed up and down the lake, scientists were carrying out various experiments. The princess talked to the institute's director and then, opening a large cardboard box, presented him with a scanning spectrophotometer which tests for chemicals in the water. But out on the lake for about four hours watching experiments to increase the lake's fish stocks, the princess warned about the dangers of intensive fish farming, pointing out the British had discovered fish farms could spread dangerous viruses. Now well over 2,000 miles from Moscow, a Buryat dance of welcome for the Princess Royal as she approached over the dusty plain.
This was the most remote settlement she would visit, to see for herself, in this little medical centre, some of the basic levels of medical care available here. The first, a traditional offering of fermented mare's milk. Not really to her taste. Shake some on the ground as a blessing, she was told, so she did. These are the descendants of the Mongols and Cossacks who had lived and fought across the wide open spaces since the days of Genghis Khan, 700 years ago. It's a harsh climate. Even in this southern region near the Mongolian border, sudden cold snaps in winter can plunge the temperatures down to minus 40 degrees. There are few facilities, no running water. This clinic, however, is one of the major improvements in a way of life that's changed little over the years. The traveling medical sister, who visits once a week, was attending some young patients when the Princess Royal arrived. And in the exchange of information and ideas, the princess, who's visited similar clinics in dozens of countries around the world, and is very experienced in matters of primary health care, was able to offer a lot of encouragement and advice. Outside, the song of welcome was still in full flow as the princess prepared to leave. East of Ulan Ude stands the Datsan Buddhist monastery. Here, with the heavy smell of burning yak butter drifting past the image of Buddha, is the only functioning Buddhist monastery in the whole of the Soviet Union. Not far from the border with Mongolia, its existence is another sign of the loosening of both religious and political controls. For just over half a century ago, on the express orders of Stalin, 75,000 Mongolian monks were executed because they were considered obstacles on the road to socialism. But even this failed to extinguish a religion so bound up with these people. And the blowing of conch horns and the chanting of priests greeted the Princess Royal. By giving permission for her visit, the authorities have publicly acknowledged their approval of the monastery. The monks now maintain links with Buddhist centers and communities, not only within the Soviet Union, but in other countries as well. Turkmenistan in Central Asia, a dry and thirsty region, 40 miles from the Iranian border where the deserts creep up to touch the edge of Ashgabat, the next stop on the Princess Royal's tour, and where, on a collective farm, she found a pocket of the enterprise economy in a field of cucumbers. These people are the aristocrats of Soviet agriculture, who are rewarded in accordance with the amount they produce, and where the average monthly wage is just over 300 pounds. The princess was told this was a good wage in a country where a doctor earns 200 pounds a month, but where the manager of this field can earn over 700 pounds. The large ones, it was pointed out, were cut up and pickled before being sold. But the princess also learned that water diverted for these crops was creating a serious health hazard. As lakes dried out, so increasing mineral salts in the soil threatened both crops and water supplies. <laughs> Women with up to 15 children are common. Some even have two in a year. And the infant mortality rate is high, over 50 in each thousand. <laughs> the 
The princess also saw a showpiece research clinic. Here, a pregnant woman in a compression chamber was having the atmospheric pressure increased to stimulate oxygen supplies to her unborn child. Doctors tell the princess, who's president of Save the Children, they would like help with more equipment. She explained her organization's role was to help with people and knowledge. And while protocol would not let Save the Children offer that help, in a region where old customs die hard, and where abortion is still the main form of birth control, she left no one in any doubt that, if asked, Save the Children resources would be made available. There were less demanding visits to be made, for Ashgabad is famous for its carpets woven from the wool of caracal sheep. These are the traditional designs, but by and large, the weavers and designers have now abandoned the urge to portray the coming of the age of the tractor. And even Lenin's portrait is only occasionally woven in. Although this is the official Ashgabad carpet factory, there's nothing automated or modern about it. The looms on which the women work, and all this work is done by women, are the same as they've always been. Skilled fingers, almost a blur, as each knot is made and cut, nine to 10,000 in each daily shift. It's a fascinating process, which starts with each young girl being taught by her mother at home so that she can make a carpet for her own diary. But surprisingly, no one can buy a carpet here, nor make and sell them privately. They're all for export. And what about all that banging? princess wanted to know. Asking to feel the weight of the hammer, and then being shown the scissors with which the final cut is made to keep the pile even. The Turkmenians are equally proud of their beautiful Ahaltikan horses, once praised hundreds of years ago by Marco Polo. This was a display the princess, an Olympic horsewoman, could really relax and enjoy. Opened in 1920, it's the only stud farm which specializes in breeding these thoroughbreds. New stables have just been built, and the stud has a stock of some 600 horses, many specially trained to take part in long-distance races, really long races, such as the Ashgabad to Moscow race two years ago, when the 4,000-kilometer course was covered in 60 days. These horses, showing off their paces for the princess, are valuable. After another race from here to West Germany, the finishers were selling for around 50,000 pounds. Stalingrad, its symbol a colossal statue of Mother Russia, with memories of enormous sacrifice in World War II. Here the Princess Royal came to walk over a mound which contains the bodies of thousands of Soviet and German soldiers. The windswept statue, the largest in the world, overlooks the present-day city of Volgograd, which for eight long months, through the summer of 1942, and on through the winter, the German army tried to conquer. Alone from that period of horror and destruction, one building remains, a flour mill, to remind those who survived of those who died. Here, among the old weapons of war that now lie rusting in the quietness of peace. In the Soviet tradition, the official memorial is on a grand scale. In the Pantheon, a huge eternal flame burns, but the Princess Royal came to lay, for the first time, a wreath of poppies from Britain. Recognizing their courage, her grandfather, King George VI, had presented the city with a ceremonial sword inscribed to the steel-hearted people of Stalingrad, a gift from King George VI 
in token of the homage of the British people. Now in her turn, she presented to her hosts a photograph of the royal family on that momentous day of victory in 1945. Around the city flows the greatest river in Europe, the Volga, called affectionately by the Russians, Dear Little Mother Volga, because it flows in the heart of every Russian. The scars of the past are healing but always under the constant reminder of one young generation that was lost forever. Distinctive, nationalistic, flourishing with over 50 million people, the Ukraine holds nearly one-fifth of the Soviet Union's population. This was Kiev, the last place the Princess Royal would visit during her long tour and where the threads of its history closely link East and West. Now, after breaking new ground across the Soviet Union, the seemingly tireless Princess Royal neatly dovetail the end of her own tour with the opening of an expansive month-long British exhibition in Kiev. It is now my pleasure to declare open the British days in the USSR, Kiev, June 1990. The exhibition is designed to illustrate what life in Britain is really like. So, here, two real WPCs strolling down a typical high street. Although whether to help or search this photographer was unclear. On the housing estate, father is obviously a standard do-it-yourself enthusiast. A quick peer into the kitchen with the obligatory golden Labrador. This is middle brow, middle income, middle Britain. And a passing glance at a typical teenager's untidy bedroom. Up-to-date technology too was on show, computers and industrial equipment. All this to foster contacts and make money for British businessmen. Down the centuries, the Ukrainians have been crushed and ruled by many different invaders who wanted to control the rich agricultural lands of what is now the third largest Soviet Republic. This region is known as the breadbasket of the nation. But even so, millions starved to death here during the collectivization of agriculture so ruthlessly enforced during the 1930s. Some Soviet farms have yet to recover from this so-called reform, which alienated the farmers from the land they tilled. On a collective farm outside Kiev, flowers are picked to welcome the Princess Royal, who, when she arrived at this small house, also took and ate the traditional offering of bread and salt. Life here is still hard, but not so harsh. And this was one of the more successful farms. But it is a pity she couldn't have paid at least an impromptu visit to a home close by, where a wedding party was in full swing. Here was the spontaneity and warmth which she'd miss on her official tour whereas tradition demands she visited only the showpieces of Soviet achievement. This generation came of age after the last war. Untouched by the shadow of Stalin's great terror, it's now exposed to the experiments of Gorbachev's new policy of glasnost, of openness. It is still uncertain just how successful it will be in opening up the whole of this vast and diverse country to the influence and progress of the modern world outside.